concepts. Um, there's always some some interesting uh, nuggets come out of these conversations. And, you know, I think this one in particular is of uh, particular interest to me um, in that, you know, yeah, I kind of have dabbled and lived in the world of startups for the past, oh gosh, I don't know, over a dozen years. Uh, and, and, and getting off on the, on the right foot, and I love that right is right in the middle of the screen here, is always kind of one of these, these critical things. And I think a lot has changed uh, over the past couple of years. And we're going to talk about that in terms of, you know, I think it's a lot easier today to get started with the right tech stack and kind of, kind of you know, set yourself up for a future in lots of different ways. And so Spencer and I are going to have a great conversation about that. Um, but first and foremost, thank you all for joining. Uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Uh, to, to do this with us. And we hope it's going to be valuable. Um, the session today is kind of intermediate to beginner. And I use intermediate first because I think, you know, let's start from there and then go down to beginner because it's because some beginner concepts, but literally, I mean, this is, we're here for you and for you all. Um, Spencer and I have a talk track that, you know, we can talk through and, you know, we have some stuff that we want to do. Um, but man, gosh, by all means, you've got a, a, a really great guest here that that is is extremely knowledgeable of lots of different things up and down the stack, um, you know, and, and not just in the technical stack. I mean, Spencer, I, you know, I'd tell you that your face, buddy, and I will, uh, has been a, an amazing CEO for a, for a young startup company as well. So if you have any questions, just really across the gamut. Um, really about the tech and how to do all these things, but but beyond that, sure, I'm, I'm sure we'd, we'd be happy to take them. So uh, before anybody asks, the recording will be available a little bit later today. I'm not sure if we're streaming to YouTube or not today. I think we might be, um, but typically, you know, these things are up there really, really quickly. And then finally, uh, for the best, I think it's like four or five questions. I think it's five questions that we get. Um, we're going to be giving away a copy of the definitive guide to cockroach db which there's a little picture of it over there on the right hand side of the screen thank god that o'reilly uh chose a, a cockroach for our book and it's not some other animal because i think that would just be kind of weird so um for great questions today we're going to be giving away uh, a copy of that book so if you don't have any and one already add it to your library of o'reilly books we'd be happy for you to get that so all right so with that i am going to come off video and i'll ask spencer if you want to join me here um First of all, I want to introduce everybody to Spencer Kimball, who is, uh, I guess you're my ultimate boss here, um, here at, at Cockroach Labs, and, and somebody that I've known for, I think I've been working here, it's almost four years, Spencer, and I think I'm, I think I've known you for five and a half now, so um, that right. thank you for doing this today. So um, Always my pleasure, Jim. Yeah. So, uh, y'all, Spencer, like I said, started Cockroach, but also has a, a deeper history in you know, startups, I actually started, I think you've started what, two companies or is it just like, I guess two, three. right? Three. three, actually. Yeah. But I think the early days at Google kind of worked a little bit like a startup, right? Yeah. When I started Google, there was 300 and something people. And when I left, there were 30,000. So I, I got to see, uh, you know, they were, they were a, a very fast growing and successful startup when I joined and they became a titanic company when I left. And of course, they've only gotten bigger. Square was similar. I think Square might have been, uh, it was bigger than Google probably, maybe four or 500 people when I joined. And um, so, I, you know, you could argue that I've actually experienced five different startups if yep. you counted Google and Square, but I've done three of my own. I'm going to I'm gonna consider Google at that point at 300 people. Absolutely a startup, dude. Like, I, I mean, you guys are reinventing basically everything at that point in time, right? Yeah, I mean, well, we, we were. And... Um, we were also inventing a, not really inventing, uh, there's no new ideas in computer science, and that's sort of true in business true. too, but they were they were being very successful in monetizing search by the time I already got there. So yeah. plus they'd, they'd really been investing in heavily in R&D and building their own infrastructure and, and you know, ultimately the, the beginnings of, of what most people understand of as cloud services in 2022, and that was in 2002. So they were pretty, pretty early to the game and they were... Uh, you know, just some incredible lessons at Google. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of those today. Um, but honestly, that work that was done, I think in that time frame at Google, Spencer has set up so many of the things that you and I have conversations about and, and probably a lot of the people on the call right now, right? I mean, it's just, the innovations were just immense. Uh, and, and you're right. I think there's nothing new in computer science. I think we expand and live on top of everything that we've all invented. But I mean, there's some pretty good innovations there, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, I think that they're still finding their way out into the broader ecosystem. 
Yeah. Like that process of, of diffusion has, is by no means complete. Uh, Kubernetes is, a, is an incredibly interesting example of that. Kubernetes is just sort of uh, starting to grasp the complexity of orchestrating the entire stack. But for quite some time, as I'm, I'm sure you remember, the Kubernetes community was fairly resistant to the idea that Kubernetes ought to orchestrate stateful infrastructure like a database, because that's not how it started. It was a little bit simpler before it became more complex and, and could handle this, I, the idea of stateful workloads. Yeah. But that is a, um, that's been an evolution. Of course, Google was using uh, Borg, which is really what Kubernetes is modeled after as early as 2000. Three two thousand four, yeah. and uh, it was doing stateful workloads, right? So you know, I, it, it was uh, you know these things are they take longer when you build them for huge general audiences. Yeah, Google is able to build just for their internal audiences. Now, of course, they're also trying to build for their public cloud GCP. So they're they're taking a slightly different approach. But you definitely can build faster when you have a narrower audience. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I was on the phone yesterday with uh, Jake Mashenka, who is. Jake actually started a company called Quay, y'all, which was basically kind of artifact repository for Kubernetes. Hey, I don't know the name of your new dog, Spencer, but that was a really good cameo. <laughs> That's Sebastian. He climbed up on the table from the back hey, of his couch here. Um, I was talking to Jake, and Jake has a company called AuthZ. They're they're actually a customer of Cockroach Labs, where I, we're gonna, they're going to present at our our, conf, our customer conference. And they're doing the same thing. They're taking Zanzibar, which is like permissions and authorizations and controls over and they're, which is an internal kind of Google project and taking it and making a company out of that. They created Spice DB, AuthZ, like, and so I think it's interesting how a lot of, we, we're living in a lot of these infrastructure components that were at Google way back. And you were on stage with, a, at, the, at the 2017 OpenStack Summit, you were on stage, you looked a little bit younger, dude. It was five years ago. <laughs> you were on stage with Alex Polvey from CoreOS showing- yeah a stateful workload and it was cockroach running on Kubernetes. And I think that was the first time I ever met you. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm going to work there. That sounds cool. That was, that was definitely a cool conference. It was exciting. Uh, yeah. that, and, and Alex, I think is a, a very uh, prime example of another person that is also part of that uh, diffusion of, of Google concepts into the much larger yeah. ecosystem. Yeah. I mean, what they did for like container Linux and, what, what that company did for Kubernetes. I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. And I, like the people I met around all this new infrastructure, I think is a key thing because anybody on the phone, if, if you aren't involved with like CNCF and some of those projects, it's it's actually a really nice community and, and people share. I think that's my favorite thing about it. But let, let's drill into kind of, let's let's take, I mean, you, you left Google and then you started Viewfinder. You adopted a couple dogs. You started Viewfinder. That eventually got bought by Square, right? And so, like, you made a lot of decisions. Uh, Viewfinder was like a photo sharing site, right? That's right. Uh, the yeah. idea of Viewfinder was a, a really a reaction to Facebook. And this was 2012. Uh, you know, I, I had already felt like I got burnt a little bit on you know, public social media. It just right. didn't seem to really mesh well with how I wanted to communicate with my friends. But I did want to share photos with everyone, just not publicly. And so uh, Viewfinder was our attempt to build something that made it extremely easy. If you're ever out for a night or for a weekend or for a week or whatever with a group, you can pull them all together and everyone can share their photos into it. And, and the distribution became very simple. And then there was yeah. a very rich chat feature around that. So you could you know, communicate all the context. And then that kind of created a little memory. And then we had this really uh, interesting system that would organize it. And you could kind of fly through the memories. A lot of that's been incorporated into other products, uh, but... You know, it, we, it was funny because at that exact, exact same time, Snapchat was getting started. And it was also a much more private approach, uh, but one that I think had a, had a lot more resonance uh, with the, the sort of uh, yeah. broader community of users out there. Um, but it, it was really interesting to, to, to watch Snapchat at the same time we were trying to build something and, and actually learned a lot of lessons from what mm -hmm. they did successfully and, and what we did successfully and also didn't do successfully. Uh, but we eventually did sell Viewfinder to Square. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I know Bourbon was about at that time. Bourbon became Instagram. Like there were a bunch of them that were kind of in response to Flickr and everything that was going on at that moment in time. That, that was a, that was like the yeah. the generation right before us. Right. Exactly. Right. And like and Stuart and Stuart ended up actually starting Slack. Right. Like I, understanding like the challenges of massive, huge distributed systems are just tremendous. I mean, there were some great engineers at the, on that Flickr team too. And they, you know, they came out of gaming initially too. It's funny how these things work out. So you ended up doing a database, right? So 
what were some of the things that you saw kind of when you were kind of defining that stack at, you know, at Viewfinder and eventually at Square, you know, what were the, some of the decisions you made kind of right and wrong at that moment in time, Spencer? It's a great question. When we started Viewfinder, we just, I say we, it was, uh, you know, Peter Madness, myself, some others, and Ben Darnell is one of the other three co-founders of Cockroach. Uh, all of us were there. And uh, we'd come from a decade of Google. And so we saw Google build things like Spanner, which had just gotten into production when we left, Big Table before that, Mega Stores in the middle, and, uh, you know, MapReduce and uh, many other things. And uh, we decided we were going to build this private photo sharing uh, company. We really wanted to build the infrastructure such that it would scale with what we hoped would be the success of the company. So that was a, a very sensible thing to do in the context of Google launching something, right? Because they're immediately going to scale to 10 million or 100 million <laughs> users, right? So everything has to scale. Otherwise, it's just going to fall over. Uh, it might not have been the right thing to do. In fact, I'd argue it wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, at Viewfinder because there was so much that we saw at Google that we wanted to see in the context of Viewfinder. We kind of like got kicked out of the Google Nest where everything could be consumed in a serverless fashion. And it was all in their equivalent of the global public cloud with all, of course, Google at the time. And uh, there were all these incredible pieces of infrastructure plus uh, sort of platform tools to build yeah. applications. And so you could sort of trivially, and it's gotten easier by the way, but even then you could uh, somewhat trivially compared to not being at Google, build an application that could scale. So we, we understood a lot of those pieces and we wanted them so badly at Viewfinder that we were like, okay, well, we're just going to start to build these things. <laughs> and so trying to build a private photo sharing application that has, you know, an Android and an iOS and a web application. At the same time, you're like, okay, well, this is where the idea of Cockroach came from. <laughs> like, hey, we need a database that's like Spanner and uh, we should do it in open source. And we feel many other people would find something like that useful. I actually got started on that for about a week and then... And then, we, uh, you know, it was like, okay, we're either going to build the viewfinder or we're going to try to build a database. But right now we're going to build viewfinder. So right. we ended up using DynamoDB in AWS. And, um, you know, predictably that had problems. It wasn't, wasn't what we wanted to see from a system like Cockroach or Spanner. Uh, but, you know, it was, it, I think it was the right decision. We also built an incredible amount of a sort of application uh, glue. But if you think about it, you got a bunch of stuff stored in the cloud. You've got a whole bunch of users, many of which are sharing with other groups of users. Uh, so you need to distribute photos. And so they kind of go into the cloud, then they go out to the, the folks that are consuming within a particular conversation. And so you have everything up in the cloud in your primary database, which for us was DynamoDB at the time. Uh, and then you have local databases and all of those iOS apps or Android apps. And so that process, which is something, for example, that Firebase does today, was something we invented from whole cloth because we needed it. And it was, it was kind of, that was, there were a number of these things. Like how do we make it so we can share code between iOS and Android? We actually figured out how to do that. Uh, we explored so many new things on our own. It was a huge distraction as you can imagine. But happily in, in 2022, there's uh, most of what we found was lacking when we started in 2012 has been not just built, but built much better than, you know, yeah. we could have possibly built it in the context of trying to do viewfinder. But there was, there was a really interesting learning in there, right? One is you want to be single threaded in your focus on whatever it is that you're trying to bring to market and you want to bring it as fast as possible. And I think that does pretty much uh, obviate the possibility of building your own infrastructure in addition to an application use case. But the other interesting thing is if you do get tempted because there's just nothing is suiting you, it's just the wrong way to do things, whatever's available. If you do get tempted to build some infrastructure, whether it's kind of an application development platform, or it's something that like, you know, really ex accelerates GraphQL usage, or it's, a, it's a, a way to deploy things faster in the cloud where you can, you know, uh, very efficiently use resources, whatever you have to invent yourself, uh, you, you can think really carefully about whether that actually should be the company that you're building. Because if you find it really useful, there's going to be a potentially huge audience out there that are building, you know, the next million applications and services that could substantially benefit from what you've already experienced as a pain, uh, you know, ideated a solution, and then even built a first version of the solution. Yeah. That's an amazing beginning for, you know, funding another company uh, for something that is, um, you know, a, a real tool with a wide audience that would find it. Uh, beneficial. You know, there's a there's a great example of this that I like historically, which is 
1849, there was a, and that was kind of the peak year of the gold rush because gold was discovered in California. And there were all these new immigrants to the United States that were, uh, you know, struck by the gold fever. Hey, we can get rich. We can go out, we'll, we'll make a new life. We'll, we'll build a better future for our children and our families. And so there was this massive uh, diaspora from really where the concentration of population was in the East Coast uh, and all those states out into the West. And it was a very dangerous trail and so forth. Well, most of those 49ers, as they were called, did not actually strike it rich in California. Uh, you know, they, they found other occupations once they were out there, and many of them died on the trail. It was a, quite a rough journey. The people that actually did get rich reliably were the people that sold the picks and the shovels and the wagons yep. in like St. Louis and other places like that that were at the beginnings of these trailheads. So, uh, you know, that's kind of where if, if you, it's great, I think, in my career to have been on both the application side of things and on the infrastructure side, because those two inform each other, right? They, they kind of go in this iterative cycle. Like, what do the applications need from the infrastructure they're not getting? Cool, let's build that infrastructure. Now we've got this amazing infrastructure. We can build applications faster. So let's figure out how to build the next, uh, the next generation of applications. And uh, I think working on both sides of that can kind of give you a a very clear view of what's needed and what might be resonant with a, a much larger audience. Yeah. Well, Levi Strauss came out, Levi's jeans came out of that whole movement, by the way, probably the, the biggest startup to come out of the whole gold rush <laughs> was blue jeans, right? I mean, there was, there was a whole bunch of stuff. And I did not know that. That's awesome. Fast forward 150 years later, we were all moving to San Francisco because it was the dot-com boom. Some mm -hmm. made money. A lot of yeah. people ended up building infrastructure companies. I remember, you know, BA Tuxedo and WebLogic and like some of these things have basically really simplified the delivery of these things at mass scale. I mean, you could argue that, you know, Bigtable and Google were also born out of that movement and it was the value is in the infrastructure. And, and I think that's a, a, a great point, Spencer. If you're building something, you see something that's making your life easier. Is that an infrastructure company? Because we've seen that, you know, we've seen Prisma and GraphBase. I know you're familiar with these guys and like things like temporal and like there's like a lot of like these tools that that are making things work that people are starting and I think it's pretty awesome. So, but but you know let's go back to a little bit like and so you use DynamoDB to start Spencer. Did you guys have to migrate? Was did that like cause you significant pain? Significant pain along the way outside of your kind of side job and starting to build cockroach, right? Like, what was the technical debt and kind of the the the, the challenges that you had in some of the poor decisions that not poor. The, the early decisions, I should say, that, that you guys made around that, that tech stack. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting one. Um, so we'd come out of Google where really it was Java and C++ uh, and, and Python. And I guess Sanjay and Jeff really liked to, to write things in Perl <laughs> originally. Right. But you know, they, they'd been starting to develop Go, but I think in 2012, it wasn't quite um, you know, where it was when we actually used Go for Cockroach in 2014. So these things all kind of have an evolution. You have to try to, you know, make the the best of, of what you have available. And you know, like I said, I started working on cockroach as an idea, maybe for a week or two, and then actually as a as a project and, and realized I needed to build something like an RPC subsystem as well. So I, I really got distracted for a week. And then Dynamo DB came out. And that was kind of one of these things where you say, we have to build this application, it's going to take a long time to build an open source database. And th these two things are not compatible. And we have an alternative here. Now, what was wrong with DynamoDB? Some of it's been corrected in the, in the interim, but it didn't have transactions. So what we decided to do is we said, okay, we're going to make this work so that when you, when you run a, an operation that a, uh, that a user initiates by clicking a, a button in the mobile application, let's say to, to send a bunch of photos into a conversation, Right. That might modify lots of different things in the DynamoDB tables that we had. Um, but since they're not all protected by a transaction, if something went wrong midway, then some things might have happened, but other things that are actually part of the sort of consistency of the larger holistic operation, they don't agree, right? You have some older stuff because the thing got interrupted midway, and you had some stuff that went through. And in a transaction, if anything fails in that process where you might be updating 100 different things, because there could easily be 100 people in the conversation, right? You're, you're kind of saying, hey, we delivered this, we delivered that, we delivered that. All of a sudden it breaks because of some bug in the logic or something like that, or some bad data in the database that it wasn't expecting. Then you have some people get the thing, some people don't. The people that don't might have something else that says they should have something, and then the thing starts yes. tripping over that. You get this huge cascading mess of problems. So what we decided is we'd make the usage of DynamoDB idempotent is what it's called. So it's a computer science concept. I mean, it goes beyond computer science, but it's this idea that 
you can run the same operation in, in this context multiple times. And eventually one of them will succeed, hopefully. And when that does succeed, nothing gets, everything becomes correct. It's like eventual consistency. Kind of right. Thing. The problem is it is so hard to make an operation truly item potent, as we discovered. There's all kinds of things like okay, any kind of randomness. You have to make sure that you start with the exact random seeds so that the sequence of things happens appropriately. But then there's even things where you can't really control. Like maybe there's an unordered um, listing that you get from the database. And sometimes it comes back the same, maybe even in testing, it always comes back the same. And then in production or whatever, there's more things or some kind of weird thing. And all of a sudden the ordering changes. And so you, 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 you know, that can break your item potency as well. There's time that can sometimes be used in operations. And all of a sudden now you've got a different start time when you run it. And then that actually creates different data, which, I mean, we, we saw an unbelievable number of problems not having transactions. Like yeah. we spent about 33% of our engineering time just trying to make the system work because of course it had bugs. Of course, this item potency thing was necessary because these operations would get interrupted with failures. And so then things would start to back up. And it was, um, it was, it was a, I think a, a necessary thing. We made it work. Yeah. But if you think about how much time could have been spent iterating on the business use case, you realize, wow, infrastructure is critically important. But, you know, I'll just say this, it was the right decision. Yeah. Using DynamoDB was the right decision at the time, but the experience of using DynamoDB was what said, uh, you know, when we, once we finished, that's what made us say, hey, we are going to absolutely build this database. Like we, yeah. we know that we want it and we suspect that we're not the only ones. Yeah. And it, it's funny, it, I, I hear that time and time again, actually your co-founder, Ben Darnell, I was talking to him about Raft one day, Spencer. And he was like, yeah, I could probably code that overnight when I was in university, but to do it for like a large mass in production, like service that's actually using something like a distributed consent, like all the weird corner cases is what's tough. And I think that's exactly what you guys found. And it's like, okay, great. Maybe there's better infrastructure for this, you know? And like, and I, let's fast forward to kind of like today. And I personally, I think it's a dream to be a developer today. Like, I think you could dream of things. I think you, I don't want to like underestimate the ease, but I think it's a lot easier to do a lot of these things because there are a lot of services. There are a lot of infrastructure components. Like I no longer have to go and provision, you know, cloud infrastructure in five different clouds. I have Terraform. I no longer have to, you know what I mean? Like, there's all these things that are there. And so if you were starting a company right now, what advice would you give yourself about like, which cloud, which set of tooling, like how, where do you go, right? Like I got a great idea, where do I start? It's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I just add a little bit more color to this idea of whether it's easier to be a software developer today or right, fair. I think it's easier to build the same things that were being built five or 10 years ago today than it's ever been, right? Like we, all of this infrastructure, especially infrastructure that's delivered as a service, yeah. right? all of the higher and higher level of abstraction, like the low code and no code platforms, GraphQL is a great example, right? Like, hey, you know, we're gonna extract, abstract you from the idea of straight SQL using Mongo. Mongo is like a, like, hey, you know, don't learn how to normalize your data model. It can all be implicit. Cool. Yeah. And, you know, you can, you can get off to the races and rapidly prototype and you can deal with complexity later. And that's also like quite an interesting tool. Uh, and, you know, I'm, there's, there's, I don't know if there's any, any right or wrongs here, but there's uh, what we keep doing as, a, as an ecosystem and aggregate is we keep making it easier to do the last generation of stuff. The problem is that as we get all of these tools and men, they have proliferated yes. at a stunning rate. Uh, they are allowing ever greater complexity. They're accommodating it. But all of a sudden, the state of the art, if you're one of these, you know, if you're in the, the current generation of building a service or an application, or whatever, it's a lot more complex. Like now you got to compete. How does Facebook do it? How does Google do it? You know, how's Twitter doing it? Um, you know, uh, if, if what we are going to stand up doesn't look favorable compared to that, it might look a little bit antique or not so good. Uh, if, if the latencies aren't good, uh, you know, are people going to use it in a place where, you know, there's a 250 millisecond jump from Australia to where we are a single region. Google and Facebook don't build things in a single region, right? So you, you kind of, all of a sudden, yes, it's easier. The tools make everything so much easier. However, you, it was exactly your point, five clouds, <laughs> right? Um, so all these different regions, there's all these tools. Well, you have, to, you have to learn a lot of things, even if you don't have to learn how to run them anymore. There's more things than ever to contend with. And so 
you know, to maybe to answer part of your question, I think the critical thing to start with is, you know, what's a reasonable state of the art where you can limit your, the, the, the scope of your complexity that you have to accommodate as a developer, such that you can build what you want to build. And you do like some people are just endlessly curious and they just always want to learn all the new different, um, you know, uh, I guess, building blocks in the ecosystem. I'd say get one of those people on your team. I'm one. not like that. <laughs> yeah, at least one. I'm not like that. So I just basically want to say, okay, what do I know? And what do I know will get the job done well? And then let's let's just keep things relatively simple within that. So if you're, for example, decide to use Go or Rust or something like that, just try to use Go or Rust, right? Don't, don't, yeah. don't try to mix in all these other things. And it, I think there's there's some... That's not to say that you don't add Python for things that is completely appropriate for. Yeah, that's totally reasonable to do. But you want to limit the proliferation of things. And so that's right. It's, it's kind of like create the stack, um, normalize it, and then let it evolve. But don't let it go way out of control where everyone just uses their own things. And actually, Google did a good job of that. I think we've done a good job of that at Cockroach. Viewfinder did a good job of that. We use Python for like the back end. Of course, we had to use the, the you know the iOS uh, environment and the in the Android environment, which was Java and Objective C or Objective C plus plus whatever you want to call it. We actually did find a way to share a huge amount of code yeah. between those by creating an underlying library that could be used from um, both platforms. So, uh, yeah, in, in today's world, it can just be fairly difficult to figure out what is that ideal stack, and and I would argue that the things that should be selected for you know, does it scale? Because, you know, I assume nobody starts a company because they, 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 their, their grandest goal is to, you know, um, have a, have a small success, right? People, people really want to maximize it. And then, like, they'd love to see um, 10 million people as active users. That would be, that's an awesome goal to have. And um, it just shows that you've changed the world a little bit, which I assume is a lot of why people are entrepreneurs. They, they want to change things. They want to, they want to make things better in some way. And so, you know, having something that is just fundamentally, uh, you know, a last or two generations ago architecture, oh, we're going to build one big application server. Uh, we're going to run that in one region. We're going to have a monolithic database next to it. Yeah, you can get started. You can build a good thing that way. It might be exactly what you know, but is that, I mean, that's the, you, you're talking about tech deck, but the, the, all of those choices are going to have to be refactored. Yeah. And what I've seen again and again in my career is just that, what you start with, you're going to be with in 10 years, largely, because that 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 incredible, incredibly fast growing block of original sort of um, code, like if it's Ruby on Rails, that was what Square was using for their sort of original, yep. um, you know, application for merchants. That thing became a an, an increasingly large and complex hairball, as I think what a lot of people called it there. That uh, you know, people there were a lot of projects trying to to reform it refactor it and um they, they often go anywhere i don't know what's happened in the since I, i've left it's been quite some time maybe they have but a, a lot of times those things um, kind of are born in a yeah. way and they die in a way right yeah so uh yeah i, I think that if you're going to start something today choose uh sort of make sure that you have a minimal stack that really does represent the next generation yeah i always think it's like choose what you know but lean forward a little bit here mm -hmm. Um, exactly. because it's all going to move forward. I think a, a bit, it's funny like you talk, like, I think the last language I actually really coded in was Ruby on, like it was Ruby and it was Ruby on rails. <laughs> like, you know, and so funny, like, so I honestly, I haven't moved beyond that, but like, when I start to look at some of the stuff that's happened today, it comes back to this kind of ease thing. Right. And, you know, Spencer, you and I've had a fair amount of conversations about the role of serverless. What does this all kind of mean in the future? You know, anybody who's on the listening right now, I mean, we have a serverless database. I I was not a believer in serverless until about, I'd say, a year and a half ago when I think I had a, a conversation with uh, one of our leads in engineering, Andy Kimball, and it was all about, you know, like, oh my gosh, like the value here is like, wow, I can just pay for what I consume. Wow, I can just get going and not even worry about this thing. Like, like in the context of a database, it's really cool. Like I don't have to manage the database at all. I just basically have... DML and DDL and eventually a REST interface and I'm doing puts and gets and like the database just works, right? And so like, what is the role of serverless in the context of this? Like, so you're building, right? Like you have infrastructure, like, is that the future? Is that kind of where things are moving? You kind of mentioned like, that's where kind of things were at, kind of at Google, right? Like, I mean, is that where we're headed in this whole game? 
Well, you know, it's a, it's a pretty broad ecosystem. So we're, yeah. we're, we're going to have the um, non-serverless options for decades to come. But I do think serverless is ascendant. And you mentioned that uh, serverless became very compelling to you more recently. Uh, I think that's been true for me as well. But, you know, serverless is a reality at Google for my, almost my entire tenure there. And everything was a shared service that you could just consume and you got charged basically exactly for what you're using. That was true in GFS. It was true in Colossus. It was true in, in uh, Bigtable. Uh, so, you know, these that process of, uh, uh, or maybe that consumption model is the best way I'd, I'd describe it, yeah. is really what brings value to serverless. You know, you don't have to learn how to run Cockroach Dedicated, which is our database as a service where we give you all your own nodes. And, but you do have to say, how many nodes do I need? How big should those nodes be? Um, oh, this database is getting very large. We're using 85% of our capacity. Our headroom's not high enough. So let's add more nodes and scale the cluster up. But that's, that's still, we're running it for you, but you're making a lot more decisions in terms of capacity planning. And let's say that you say, well, we're going to use a three-node cockroach cluster because that's really the minimum to get the, the, the right properties we want. But this is a really small use case. Or we want to run a whole bunch of small use cases on here, but have really tight isolation in terms of resources. Now, this is where serverless really comes in and adds value, right? Because serverless allows you to start extremely small and fast, which can be free in the case of cockroach serverless, right? It's free up to 250 million requests a month, which is, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty healthy number. You could, you could, you could run a, a startup on that until you get to product market fit. Uh, but as soon as you scale past that free threshold, um, first of all, you don't have to add nodes or anything like that. It's just you, within that uh, much bigger physical cluster that your, your virtual serverless cluster is, is a part of, you can scale massively. Right? So you, there's no more of this capacity planning. Start however you need, scale to wherever you need. And it just kind of happens. And you get charged for exactly what you have consumed. And so that, that's really the benefit of serverless. And, we're actually also seeing that serverless is dramatically useful, um, not just, for example, for a new start or, uh, you know, let's say 10 new starts for a single organization. It's actually useful when you start thinking about, um, you know, traditional SaaS plays. So software as a service. So think about Salesforce. They're the like ultimate software as a service uh, or Workday, right? Those are kind of the, the first generation of, of SaaS companies. They've got hundreds of thousands of customers. Right. Each one of which needs to have a database, and each one of those customers, you want to get have them give them a database that feels like it's totally their own database. You don't want to have noisy neighbors that can interfere with whatever their traffic patterns are. You want them to feel very isolated, like we own all this, and that's right. kind of what a dedicated cluster would give you. However, when you think about any of these SaaS plays, you might have a you know a, a, a quite a distribution of consumption across your different tenants or end customers. Right? Some might just kick the tires for part of a day and then never use it again. You certainly don't want to give them a database with their own nodes or whatever. You're just going to be paying for that uselessly as those things sit there idle, uh, still consuming electricity or whatever, doing background processing tasks, right? So that doesn't work. Um, you don't want to put them all into a Postgres database where the noisy neighbor problem can become huge because in a lot of these SaaS plays, something that uh, one of those tenants initiates like a query on Atlassian or a, like a big query on the Salesforce system of record data, that could actually chew up a lot of resources, which could be felt in terms of much slower processing times by, for other tenants that have nothing to do with that, right? So that isolation is another really critical component that you're looking yeah. for. Uh, but what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, for those bigger companies that have many, many tenants themselves, serverless is an incredible way to consume such that everything is efficiently utilized. You know, they're all sharing the same pool, uh, but they have good uh, resource isolation and limits. Uh, and uh, any one of those tenants, and this is also true, the scale of each one of your tenants can, is a huge distribution as well. Some are huge. There's a good middle of the road. And then there's some that are tiny and barely put anything in there. And so you, you, you want to make sure those huge ones can scale within in the system. And the small ones use exactly what they need. So it's, it's all about consumption. But uh, this is, I think serverless is the way that you get a lot more out of your, fun, your underlying physical resources. And by the way, serverless is, as a concept in databases is not that different from what VMware brought to market, where many companies mm -hmm. had all of these 
physical machines sitting in data centers. And the only way to use a physical machine was to give the whole physical machine to a use case. And VMware came in there and they said, hey, we're gonna create these virtual machines out of the machines and we can have many. And so we can, we can, we can put lots of different use cases onto the same machines, isolate them in appropriate ways and, and, and really um, get far more, I think the average utilization in the, the world before virtual machines was, was abysmally low, yeah. like 10, 15%. And they raised that dramatically up. So the cost savings inherent in that just tremendous. We see the same thing with the database. We see it for lots of small use cases that are on a public cluster like DynamoDB. That's what our serverless clusters look like today. But we see it within a big organization, everyone consuming uh, you know, just the serverless resources that they need for, for that use case or that tenant. Well, and Spencer, I love the the you know likening this to what VMware did with VMs and kind of you know optimizing CPU utilization. You're also, I mean, it, it created massive efficiencies in terms of the operations and the people and what you had to do to hire to actually run all these things, right? Because I mean, before virtualization, you had like what, like three people per ten servers or something, or you know what I mean? Like you were able to just do a lot more. And I, you know, I to me, one of the coolest parts about serverless is like. Yeah, I can start a company. I don't even have to hire the person to do the DBA mm -hmm. kind of thingies. You know what I mean? Or like the the manage because gosh, it is hard to hire people right now, um, especially if you're a startup and you're competing against these huge, massive companies that are, you know, I mean, we. we I think it's we, especially yeah. hard to hire people that are experts at uh, you know uh, site reliability engineering. Right. right? Like, how, how do you run things in the cloud? And and I think that's just driving so much of the expansion into cloud services. That's right. It's just not possible to uh, add that kind of capacity, even if you've got the money for it. There just aren't enough uh, of those of those qualified, uh, you know, resources to to go around. Yeah. Right. So, I, I actually see that services and uh, services in general are going to be increasingly ascendant. It's just a requirement because people can't run things anymore unless they they opt for that. There's just not enough capacity out there in terms of the. Um, the what do you call it the, the sort of recruiting capacity they just right. the, the people with the raw skills but like if you're offering a service in your aws you're offering a service in your cockroach labs or mongo or whoever pick your your vendor they can hire for those sres and they have economies of scale yeah right so a smaller and smaller number of sres can provide for a, a larger and larger number of customers as these as these uh, systems evolve and of course with serverless uh, you just have this ability to say i I'm going to pay for exactly where I'm getting value. Yep. Not like I've got to scale this, you know, I, I might need to get this thing to get this big in several months. So I'm going to make sure I have a bigger cluster than I need. And maybe I don't use it. And then I got to try to down uh, scale it. And this, this is all sort of a thing of the past. It's like, I, if, if I start out and I don't have a single customer because I haven't launched yet, I'm a, I'm a yep. startup. That's great. I'm in the free tier. Yep. And then like, you know, the, as happens, if you're, let's say you're trying to make a, a private photo sharing uh, system like Viewfinder, you launch something, you think it's going to be great. And there's only a little bit of a trickle. Maybe your marketing is wrong. Maybe the product was too hard. And then you kind of look at the data. What was the user journey? Right. Like, what is the data showing us about like uh, uh, whether people um, stick around? What were they doing that made them stick around? How do we make that easier to do in the product? You start to iterate. And right? so then you, you launch again, you get some more users. Okay, maybe now we, we actually had a release that actually got some really good traction. We, we had a good channel to get new users into it. And we scale past the free tier. Right now I put my credit card in and now I'm just paying you know, $2 a month because it's just a tiny bit past. Okay, now we start to get product market fit and then, yeah. then we're paying $100 a month. But like it's a, it's a gradual uh, scaling process that doesn't, doesn't cause you to uh, hemorrhage a bunch of cash up front for stuff that you're not even using. Right. I think that's just going to pervade the ecosystem. It's better. It's better for us as a vendor in terms of uh, how, how, how low our prices can be because we're more efficiently using these resources. And it's of course much better for the end customer, both for the price, but also just, it's even less complex. I'm not yeah. even running it myself and I don't have to do any capacity planning. It's just going to meet my needs wherever I am. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting, Spencer, because I, I, I contend that there's a company to be made around uh, helping people deliver their software as a service across multiple cloud providers because like the infrastructure across AWS and GCP and Azure and got it, you know, got all the others that you want to actually throw out there. It's fundamentally different. Right. And I think that's kind of one of the bigger challenges. So, you know, as you're building a startup, uh, thinking through where you're going to offer your, whatever it is as a service, that initial decision is pretty important. 
I think, because that's where you're going to get your audience. And then, I mean, we went through this in building out, you know, our our managed service, right? Like it was like we're great at building a database. Holy God, whoa, we had to build this on three. Yeah, we, we had a we had a very steep learning curve. Yeah, as I'm sure every company out there has had, and I've I've heard quite Easy. a few of those stories. I think that you have a fantastic idea there. So anyone who's uh, I wish. on this call, <laughs> I'll tell you this: the process of building a database as a service. And I'm sure any piece of infrastructure as a service. Anything is a service. In any SaaS business where you're storing your customers' data, the amount of security compliance is, is off the charts. And so you need to get SOC 2. And then if you're storing anything that's credit card related, PCI or anything that's healthcare related, HIPAA, and, uh, you, government needs this thing called FedRAMP. And there's just many, many of these certifications that are required. And then of course you need lots of sort of operational um, processes that, that uh, make it so that the sort of uh, the, the weakest link in a security chain is often like the human element, but the processes that you put into place uh, around how devices are managed and, and how people change the passwords and whether the two-factor authentication, all of that makes it so that the human element is strengthened, right? In terms of right. uh, your security exposure. The cost of running things like Splunk in order to like log every single thing that happened, SNCC, there's I mean, the list of vendors that we've had to engage in order to 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 get up to that level of compliance is is staggering, and the cost is staggering. Yep. So you, you, the the idea of and the complexity and, and, is staggering. Yeah, and, and yeah. exactly what you said. To try to try to make it work with AWS is one thing. Then you add GCP, and you realize the idiosyncrasies are not trivial, right? And then you have Azure, and then you say, "Oh, it would be cool if we were on DigitalOcean, or let's be on Alibaba Cloud right. uh, or Baidu's Cloud." Um, and there's clouds in Europe. And then, you know, uh, when you start to when you start to think about all of that and, and actually do it in practice, you realize that uh, it's a it's a years long effort. And, you know, that might only get you to you know a handful of the That's big right. clouds. And so if there was a platform that um, I, I... consolidated all of this effort, it would be tremendous. I mean, I, I think that's an incredible company. Um, and. You know, I think it, it, someone <laughs> someone ought to do it. It's it's hard, but somebody ought to do it because yeah. it's definitely like I saw our team go through this. It was it just. And yeah, I'll mention through. another one which is huge, which is just uh, consumption based billing. Oh yeah, and people are you say okay, we well, could use Stripe for taking the credit card. Yeah, but that's that's a tiny fraction of what you need that's to do right. if you want to do a serverless product or even uh, a non serverless product in some cases. But you're know, trying to track everything the end user does and and, and appropriately build them and apply the discounts and and, and you know. Uh, marshal that data and create the invoices and things. It is, uh, you know, we, we work with a vendor that does that as well, but to tie all these things together. And, and I, I do, I do know of a couple of companies that invested in one that, that's doing something kind of similar, but uh, not as, as broad based as what you were suggesting, which I think would be pretty exceptional. Dude, it's been a problem for a long time. And when I actually did code professionally and I did actually do that, I was working with cell phone companies in, in Europe basically on their billing and rating engines. So as calls came through and as they used call forward, and back then every text was charged, like that consumption base and the tracking of all that stuff across millions of users, that was one of the most complex engines I was ever in. It was awesome. I mean, it was amazing to be a part of that team because it was such a big problem. But I think we're at the point now where we are kind of like getting to that thing. Like, so last question, Spencer, and it has to do with this kind of, um, you know, choosing... You know, look, at you're going to probably be multi-cloud eventually. I don't know if you're doing things as a service. Depends on what you're doing, right? But like, how does somebody choose a cloud provider? Like what if somebody was, if somebody asked you like, look, at, I'm going to start a company tomorrow. I'm going to start building. Where do I go? Like what, what is your, what, what are the things people should consider, I guess? I think there's two factors that just occur to me off the, you know, top of my mind. I like giving you, know, one you the would... oddball question, Spencer. It's better this way. <laughs> it's a good one because it's a it's a it's a fundamental choice. You know, Tough talking one. about picking the right stack. I mean, that's that right. A big part of the stack, right? Where, where, what's the environment you're going to start in? And and clearly, you know, whatever environment you do choose, I'll just back up for a second. You definitely want to plan to expand to other environments. Like let's right. say you choose AWS because they're the biggest or whatever. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, but you, you definitely don't want to close off yourself to expanding into GCP. And if your infrastructure, I mean, this goes completely without saying, but even if you're, even if you're trying to build a SaaS application, you might be surprised that you're, you're really going to, the clouds don't interoperate well yet, right? But uh, that's, that's, in, that's something where you, know, you do not want to close off your options. Uh, if, 
there are um, quite a bit of idiosyncrasies, though, just to our last conversation, uh, where, you know, I do think it does matter to start with the one that's going to be most appropriate in order to get traction, then yeah. you can expand. But, you know, in order to not close off avenues to use other clouds, you got to be careful about what you use. Like I'd use third-party vendors that work across the clouds already. If, you know, you need a lot of third-party vendors when you, when you stand up one of these things in the end, you'd be surprised. So, uh, you know, just using something that Amazon provides, AWS, well, you know, it, it's super expedient and the price is unbeatable or something. There are reasons that you'd use it, but plan to have to find alternatives to that as you go forward. Better, I think, is to say, hey, we need Kafka. Uh, we don't want right. to run it ourselves. We're going to use Confluent. They work across all the clouds, so this is great, right? We'll, we'll just use Confluent, and when we want to expand, that's one vendor we don't have to figure out what to do as an alternative. Uh, you know, if you use, uh, you know, something that is only within a single cloud and doesn't look like it's going to expand to other clouds, that's just something you're going to have to work around in the future because yeah. you will need to use the other clouds. Maybe it's because you want to move your entire service because it's way cheaper or it has something that you, you know, it's just much closer to your customers. Which actually gets us to the heart of the question, which is how do you choose? I think there's two things that are dimensions that I think are really relevant. One is where is your skill set or the people on your team? That's right. Because if everyone's an expert at GCP and you're building a SaaS application, your end customer probably doesn't care about that, probably. Right? And everyone's familiar with GCP. Let's get off to the ground running. Let's just use GCP here. And, and then we'll, we'll reevaluate. But we like in a startup, the best advice is fail fast. I'm sure everyone's heard that before. Fail fast. Tell everyone about your idea that you can. Don't hide anything. Don't go into stealth. I mean, I think only Apple should be in stealth. And that was sort of a Steve Jobs special. But like most companies should not be in stealth, especially startups. Uh, you, you want as much sunlight on your idea as possible. Sometimes bits of your idea will totally disintegrate in the sunlight. That's good. <laughs> That's very good. You do not want those disintegratable bits of your idea to like cause toxic mess for you down the road because you can't let go of them. Let people criticize your stuff. Let people say, hey, some this other company is doing exactly what you're doing. It's like, that's a terrible news to get, but you definitely want to get that news, right? So uh, yeah, you, you definitely want to uh, fail fast. So choose the, the cloud that you're going to be able to move fast on. Uh, but then the other thing is, what do your customers want? Like, uh, where are your customers? So if you're infrastructure and you say that, you know, the product we're building is really good for startups, which cloud has the most startups? It's probably AWS, right? I, I don't know for sure. It might be dependent on what kind of startup wants your, your idea. That's right. Um, maybe it's like the Fortune 500 or the Fortune 50. Where are they? You might choose Azure. Or you might say, we absolutely need multi-cloud from the beginning. But like, you got to look at your customers there. That's really going to inform the decision. Yeah. It, it's funny. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that YC says to certain startups, Spencer, that I agree with and disagree with, like name your product, the name of your company. I wholeheartedly disagree with that, by the way. But I love that that word labs and database, by the way. I love it because um, it opens you up for other things. One of the things they do talk about, though, is like fail fast and like get it out there. Don't do private betas. Like don't do private, like weird. Well, if you do a private beta, thing. make it real short, right? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Get, get the like, signal right? you want from that. Yeah. And, and, and you but can do a private beta, but you don't have to be in stealth, right? I mean, the cool thing right. about a private beta is stealth. just uh, you can you can work on the product market fit with cohorts that you can that you trust enough that you're going to get feedback from them. Yeah. Uh, without like kind of spraying your thing everywhere, and then you can say, okay, that's we're going right. to fix it for the group that's going to give us the best feedback, and then once they're really using it, and we've optimized for them. Now let's start to move to like more public cohorts that we're not going to get the signal from. So yeah. you know, I think that's okay. I, I just. The thing I've seen a lot of people do is like they, they they start trotting out the NDA. You know, they're very very early and they're talking about NDAs. It's like whatever your idea is, even if it's the best idea in the world, uh, someone else has thought about it. Just keep that in mind. And probably many people have thought about it. The difference between you and all those other people is that you're going to execute on it. And that's what you have to believe fundamentally, and that's the superpower. Do you have the the guts and the motivation and the impetus somehow driving you to make that idea a reality? That is what's going to make you win. And um, of course, I think uh, part, part of that is just whatever idea you have, the execution of it requires a lot of iterative feedback and the application of uh, the, that feedback to, to make the product better. And then to look at the data, like what's working? What, are these cohorts better than the last set of cohorts? What's different about them? How much did it cost to acquire them? Like uh, w when people really apply that, that uh, data-driven product development 
uh, cycle, they I've just seen a dramatic difference in yeah. uh, the viability of the of the effort. Yeah. Well, I'm going to leave it there because that is the best advice I think anybody can get. And if you're starting a company, it's about people and it's about executing and it's, you know, make it like these, your idea is not unique. I'll tell you right now, your idea is not unique. There's a lot of humans on this planet who are kind of walking in similar worlds as you. I, I love that, Spencer. And then if you're, if you don't want to start a company, you want to work at a company, go look at the founder and Spencer, you, you emanate this principle, like the, can you execute and make the thing happen? Uh, and you've been doing it your whole career. So if, if you aren't going to start some, find the people that are going to go out and do it uh, and are humble and are modest and can talk about these things and want to share and all those things. I, I just find that to be such a such an important part of every decision when people are choosing where to work and what they're going to do. Because your startup is a place you're working to, by the way. You know, and, and, and that culture and the people thing gets really important. So, uh, but it's one of the reasons I work here. So Spencer, thank you so much. It's my my side compliment to you and thank you at the very end of our talk, but I really, really appreciate it. So um, I do hope right. it was valuable for everybody. Any, anything else uh, going away comments, Spencer? Hmm. <laughs> you ah, on come on, you, you were pretty good. That was a pretty good end. Um, let's see, any other advice for choosing the right, well, you know what, I, here, here's something which I think is pretty important that I saw at Google and they did it very well. Whereas I think I've been to a lot of other companies where they didn't. And that is that Google is never afraid to build the next generation and throw out the previous generation. Yeah. And so the way they did that wasn't, okay, we have this, let me give you an example of something I worked on. I worked on something called Colossus, which was the successor to GFS. GFS was invented, and I think the paper came out in 2002, it was invented a bit before that, but it was the Google file system where they stored all of the uh, you know, it wasn't quite a file system. It's more like a block storage device yep. or something like that. Uh, and, and Colossus was meant to be something like a 10x or 100x the scale of one because they were getting thousands of these GFS clusters. They're like, okay, you know, it'd be nice if we only had hundreds of Colossus clusters. Maybe they have thousands of those now. They probably do. Uh, but GFS was a very evolved system by the time Colossus started getting into production. It had been there for almost not quite 10 years, maybe like uh, five to seven years or something like that. It had lots of bells and, whistle, wells, bells and whistles. There were many, many use cases, thousands of them on there. And they, instead of trying to say, okay, the, the next generation is going to be able to move all of those use cases over to Colossus, that would have been an incredible failure right? because those thousand use cases, they, they together, they used every bit of surface area that GFS had evolved over those seven years. Colossus, in order to get started, they took a very intelligent direction, which I think I've seen in lots of different Google projects where they're inventing the next generation. They said, what's the most important thing that we need Colossus to do? Uh, well, it needs to store these, these big blobs of data and things, but it needs to do it in such a way that we can put a lot more blobs into one cluster. And we need to do it in a way that we can, there's some, some additional cost saving. We just something called Reed Solomon encoding. Yeah? Yep. That, those two things were the primary objectives. What they did is they found a, a lighthouse customer internally that was struggling under the idea of having to run on GFS. They needed Colossus more than anything. They needed those differentiators. So we built Colossus really for that one customer. And then we got them working on it. And then we said, okay, what's the next customer that should move? Or what's the next couple customers? And then we started adding the little bits and pieces that would need to get there. And then you, you kind of do that for a few iterations and you, you start to get through the, the bell curve of all the different uh, you know, use cases that we're using very small subset of GFS functionality to the most surface area ever, right? And once you get kind of into the, the middle of that bell curve, then Google said, okay, now everyone needs to move to Colossus and we'll help you do it. But like the thing works really well. A lot of people are already on it. Now you start to move over. But Google did that across the board, many pieces yep. of infrastructure and things. And so I think when you... You know, no matter what stack you choose, you're going to get tech debt. And it's, you know, it, it's both because the ecosystem moves beyond your stack just in the time you're using it. And so there's better stuff out there. And so your stuff starts to look a little bit creaky compared to what you could do with the new stuff. Uh, but also complexity begets complexity. And um, what, you know, as th that complexity scales, just inevitably, just a, just right. a normal part of the cycle, right? Uh, you you start to cement mistakes that were made uh, or or things that didn't quite fit or where there's better alternatives. And, you know, the, you're going to get to a point, even if you choose the perfect stack when you start, where you don't have the perfect stack anymore. So that evolution is really critical. And so 
I, I think that what, what you should strive for isn't necessarily the big discontinuities. We're going to get a totally new stack now. That's, a, I think, a failure mode. It's more how do you kind of replace right. the engine in the car while the wheels are still moving or the wheels where the engine's running. And, you know, that, that, can, that can be difficult at every step. But I think amortizing that cost is important. Otherwise, you end up with a like a one of these things that nobody wants to touch anymore, and it's like a, a not understood by anyone. The complexity is scaled beyond uh, what anyone can handle. So that refactoring has to happen, and you have to expect it, even if I think you make very intelligent initial decisions. And that is tech debt right there, buddy. So cool. Well, thank you, Spencer, for doing this. Thanks everybody for joining us. We're right at the top of the hour. Um, but uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I do hope this was valuable. Hopefully you got a couple of good nuggets out of this conversation. Uh, you know, we're always open to feedback and, and everything else. Um, I think there is a survey that happens at the end of this, but to everybody, thank you for joining us. And Spencer, um, as always, thank you. I enjoy these conversations so much. So 